Heraclitus says when you step in the river and pull your foot out and you go right back in, not only has your, your, the river changed, but your foot has changed also. Cleitus, his student, went further than that. Cleitus says you can't step in the same river once. That in the process of stepping in it, it changes. So on the one side, we have this smooth, running, Euclidean, Newtonian world, and on the other side, we have this Heraclitian world. Everything goes very smoothly through Galileo, Descartes, all of these people, uh, Newton, and, and comes down to about 1911, and some little short guy comes out of the woodwork and upsets the whole apple cart. And his name was Einstein. And he came in and he introduced a concept called relativity, uh, the special theory and the general theory. Up to that time, science, classical science, said there are four things we're working with. We're working with mass, energy, space, and time. And Einstein said, space and time are really the same thing, guys. There's no difference. And any self-respecting physicist in the last uh, 90 years doesn't mention the word time without a hyphen in space, or space with a hyphen in time. And he said that energy and mass are really interchangeable. So he, he took all of this stuff that we'd counted on for all these centuries and eons and took them away from us. The only thing he really left us with as a constant was the speed of light. And then comes along quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics says, hey, that's no limitation. There, there are dozens and dozens of things that travel faster than the speed of light. And now we're, we're sort of left with nothing. And John Bell comes in in 1964 with what's known now as the Bell Theorem, which it says that there is no locality of causes, that there isn't a cause and effect, the stimulus response that we all learned in school, that everything is connected to everything else, that you and I are connected. Right now, you and I have been intimate with each other already because you've breathed out part of your body and breathed in part of mine, and we don't notice it, but we've been very, very intimate with each other already since we've been in this room. And John Bell says that we are all connected together. Then, after that, a guy who just passed away a couple of years ago, David Bohm. Um, in my opinion, a hundred years from now, people are going to look back and they're going to say the most famous person, world-changing person in the entire 20th century was a scientist by the name of David Bohm. David Bohm was an American. He was a graduate student of Einstein's at Princeton. He was Einstein's favorite student of all and got somehow messed up in the McCarthy hearings in the 50s and said, I will not live in a country that acts like this, moved to London, became a physics professor at the University of London, and he went further than Bell. He, what da David Bohm said, is that everything not only is connected, but everything is the same thing. And that has some far-reaching re aspects. It means that you and I and the market are the same thing that the market is not one of these big economic, fundamental, mechanical, or technical kind of operations. The market is really a composite of all these millions of human traders like you and I who are making these crazy, chaotic decisions in our life. Now, let's talk about chaos for, for, for a moment, because chaos is going to affect your life much, much more in the next 20 years than either relativity or atomic fission or any of these other scientific advances. If you knew everything there was to know about chaos, and if your job was to throw as many people off base as you possibly could by naming it something it isn't, you would call it what? Chaos. We, we have, a, we have a, uh, a talent for misnaming things. You and I think we're right now that we're talking with our conscious mind or we're communicating with our conscious mind, right? The left hemisphere up here. But that's the only part of your brain that ever goes to sleep. It's the only part of your brain that is really unconscious from time to time. And yet we call it the conscious mind. If you really understood what chaos is, chaos is not randomness. Chaos is a much higher form of order. And what I'd like to suggest that you, you remember from this presentation is that the next time you hear the word chaos, uh, as in the science of chaos, chaos is a bad name. The real, in, the real message or the real meaning of this science is how you handle new information. So chaos is new information. And we call it chaos, but it's new information is a much more descriptive term. Then we, we come to the part of how do we handle new information? Because up here on the chart, what you see is new information every time you look at a chart. The first thing you have to do, or what the first thing we normally do when new information comes in, we try to organize it. We try to put it into old categories. So we say, well, what is it like? It reminds me of this, or is it like this? 
what we're doing is we're massaging this new pristine information and putting it into old categories. And we'll, we'll squirrel it around and bend it around and make it plastic so it'll fit in there. Um, I had, in my younger days, I had an experience, a bad experience, with a lady who happened to have red hair. And, and I judge from that experience that, that any, any female with red hair is absolutely no good. So today, when I see a red-headed lady, unless I catch myself, I've already made a judgment. I don't even know who she is. I've never met her. But this is because I have, I've massaged this new information into this old category that stay away from red-headed women. Now, we all do this. We all try to organize any kind of incoming information. Once we have anything organized, it doesn't matter whether it's a note you're taking or the IRS or whatever, there is a strong tendency, the first priority of any organization is to survive. Now, we're in an election year, and not so much now as we get closer to the election, but last year there was a lot of talk about doing away with the IRS, getting a flat tax, a consumption tax, or whatever. Can you imagine what would happen with the hundreds of thousands of employees at the IRS the hundreds of thousands of CPAs and tax lawyers if we really try to do away with the IRS. They're going to try to keep that thing going. You, once a bureaucracy in government is... is